This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIB, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on December 5th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today, I am in Heidelberg, city in Germany. I'm here to attend the giant virus meeting. You'll be hearing a, a twib from there as well. But I thought while I was here, I would stop by and see uh, my guest who is here at the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research, Matthias Fischer. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure having you here. I have been wanting to have you on uh, TWIV for many years. And uh, I, I thought of, of having you on at the, at the um, giant viruses meeting, which is later this week, but you said you're too busy and you want to be able to focus on the meeting. So we would do it here instead. Well, since you were coming anyway to Heidelberg before and yeah. drive down with us. So um, while, while I'm here, this is the Institute. And then there is also University of Heidelberg right next to us. Exactly. Where there is some virology and we'll do a, yes. a, a podcast there as well. Uh, but let's start... Uh, with you, Matthias, tell us your history. I know you're originally from Germany, right? I am German, exactly. I grew up in a small town in the uh, very eastern part of Bavaria uh, called Passau. And uh, then I moved to university in Bayreuth, which is the northern part of Bavaria. Mm -hmm. And there I studied biochemistry. So how did you know you wanted to study biochemistry? Oh. Well, um, I think I got excited late high school, the mm -hmm. last two years. Mm -hmm. We had a fantastic biology teacher. So shout out to Mr. Burgel, <laughs> if he's still alive. <laughs> uh, he really got me excited in cool. uh, genetics and molecular biology. Mm. And I thought, what's the best way to get there, either okay. biology or biochemistry? And then I favored biochemistry and applied and got accepted. And so that's what brought me to Bayreuth. So uh, the university biochemistry, and that's a four-year program, I presume, right? Uh, it was a bit longer than that. It was uh, five years. Mm -hmm. um, we still didn't have the bachelor master's distinction. It was a oh. diploma that we got in the end. Okay. So it's kind of like a bachelor master's combination. Exactly. Right? All right. So at the, at the end of the five years, what did you do? Well, um, towards the end of my biochemistry studies, I got the chance to partake in an exchange program mm. with the University of California for one year, which was a fantastic experience. Where, which uh, campus was that? Uh, that was in Berkeley. Berkeley. Lovely. Yes. <laughs> very lovely. And it was also my first peek into virology. So I became fascinated with viruses during uh, the years in Bayreuth, but unfortunately there wasn't really a chance to start a project yeah. that dealt with viruses. Um, so moving to Berkeley was a fantastic opportunity to see if that would be something I could do my PhD on. So at Berkeley you took courses, right? I took courses. I also worked in the lab of Lloyd Walkman mm -hmm. on bacterial viruses okay. as an undergrad researcher, which was a great experience. And that confirmed me in my decision to pursue a PhD okay. in neurology afterwards. Okay. Where did you do that? So the question was uh, where to go, what topic yeah. to pick. Um, First of all, I did like the uh, uh, West Coast mm -hmm. of the American <laughs> continent. Yeah, it's nice. That was enticing. So that's why you didn't come to my lab, because I'm on the East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> right. And also, at the time, I read a paper by Curtis Suttle mm -hmm. from the University of British Columbia about the diversity of viruses in the ocean. And that was a topic that I had never encountered before. What year was this, roughly? That was roughly 2003. So that paper that he had published, where he has a, pi a figure of staining seawater with cyber green. Yes. And you see lots of virus particles in it. Exactly. Or had that been just recently published? It was a review article. Um, I think it came out in Nature around that time. But yes, it did have those cyber images. That's cool. And it also had a lot of numbers in it, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, showing that there are 10 million virus particles on average per milliliter of seawater. Which we didn't realize before he no. did that experiment, right? And of course, nobody knew what all these viruses were. So and I what thought- they, What they infected, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, most of these were known to be bacteriophages, but again, the exact nature of mm -hmm. the hosts and the viruses was not known. So I thought this would be a really interesting area. Right, um, right. 
And so I applied to his lab and I was there for a visit and uh, checked out the environment mm -hmm. and uh, seemed very friendly. And mm -hmm. so I ended up in his lab. Yes. That's how I started in Vancouver, right. where I stayed for six years. Um, it was a bit longer than a PhD would have taken me in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's both owing to the fact that uh, degrees take a bit longer in the American system. Yeah. You have to yeah. take courses first. And also the nature of the project um, was really not designed to be completed in three years. So what I was presented with was a new virus that had isolated a couple of years before I arrived mm -hmm. from the Gulf of Mexico and it affected a heterotrophic flagellate, so a microscopic eukaryotic organism. Um, but not much was known about either the host or the virus. So these had been de already described in Curtis's lab before you got there? Yes. There was the a virus paper, and the host, okay. Um, already at his time in Texas, so he was uh, yeah. in Texas before and then mm -hmm. moved to British Columbia. Mm -hmm. And since then, not much else had been done on this virus host system. And it seemed to be a large virus. At the time, the family that was most likely um, to be a candidate family for this virus were the Phycodinaviridae, which was a family of algal viruses, large okay. algal viruses. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the assumption when I started that it would be a new Phycodinavirus infecting this zooplankton. Um, so I started characterizing the system and the first thing you do is you're trying to amplify the virus by growing it on the host cultures, mm -hmm. um, learning how to deal with the host itself, growth conditions, purification conditions, and so on. And very early on, I stumbled across a big problem, which was that the old lysates that were presented to me, which contained the virus, mm -hmm. worked very well in establishing new infections and yielding new virus particles. Mm -hmm. So my goal was always to produce a new stock that I could use for the experiments with fresh virus, but those stocks never killed the host. So I got no fresh production of the big virus right. from these recent stocks. By the way, what's the name of the host? The name of the host now is Cafeteria Burkhardi. Ah, uh, too bad. It, it took Ron Bergensis out, right? <laughs> Ron Bergensis uh, was the previous name, exactly. Okay, it got Burkhardi. reclassified. Okay. Yes. And why is it called Cafeteria? Um, the most likely assumption is that it is a very voracious feeder right. on bacteria. So you can find it anywhere in the world's oceans. These are saltwater or marine uh, These cells. are marine species. Okay. Exactly. You call them heterotrophic. Yes. What does that mean? That means they don't photosynthesize. They need organic material to feed on, and okay. that's in the form of living bacteria. Okay. And they, they uh, phagocytose the bacteria? Or? They phagocytose them, exactly. All right. And they're a very important component of the marine food web. They transfer all the energy and the carbon mm. from okay. the bacteria up to the higher trophic levels. So the um, virus is Cafeteria Bercoldi? No, we still call it Cafeteria Rohnbergensis virus. So Crow V. Crow V, is the name short. of the virus. Yes. Okay. All right. So you were trying to grow stocks and that wasn't working. That wasn't working. And it was quite frustrating mm -hmm. because we didn't have any information about the genome. We had no protocols available. So you're basically starting from scratch. By the way, how do you titrate the virus. There's no black assay, I presume, because these are swimming. <laughs> no, we hosts. did exactly those cyber staining experiments and counting them on slides under the microscope. I see. That's how we figured out how many virus particles we had. And you could never amplify uh, the, the, the titer, basically, in your experiments. Not from the recent stocks, exactly. So the old lysates worked very well. Yeah. And that was always a bit of a conundrum. And you didn't want to just rely on the old lysates because eventually they would run out, right? There was a very limited quantity of those, <laughs> okay. absolutely. Okay. So they were precious. So it took us a while to figure out what the reason for this uh, problem was. Mm -hmm. But um, so I have to also mention that at the time when I started, which was 2004, that was also the year when the Mimivirus genome paper was published in right. Science. Right. And of course, that caught my attention at the time, but we didn't have any genome information about it yet, except for a little snippet of a helicase gene that was mm -hmm. just randomly sequenced from a random PCR. And previously, before the Mimivirus genome was published, it was most closely related to a Phycodinavirus. But after that, it turned out to be a very close relative to the Mimivirus genome. So we already got a glimpse of where this journey might take us. And you it, had some genome sequences already of Crow-V. 
as I said, only a random amplified piece of a well, helicase. And that happened to match, oh, because the Mimi genome was done in its entirety, right? Yes, okay. exactly. Got it, okay. And that helicase had a homolog in the Mimi virus genome. Okay. So we got a little preview of mm. where this virus might fit. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until years later when we got the first genome data about Crow-V. And I spent about one entire year trying to construct shotgun libraries the old-fashioned way. Mm. So you shred up your genome, you put the pieces in little plasmids, you clone the plasmids into bacterium and then try to purify and sequence them. Was that here in, in uh, Heidelberg? Or was no, no, it that was all in Vancouver, Vancouver, in Curtis's lab. Okay. And none of that worked. So we tried the most specialized vectors we could get our hands on at the time, <laughs> but we obviously dealt with something that was called unclonable DNA. Mm. So only very specific pieces, um, namely the, the tRNA genes which occur in this virus, were able to go into such vectors and be sequenced. Got it. But for the most part of the genome, we didn't get any sequence from those experiments. So one year in the lab, no results, basically. And then, fortunately, these new techniques for sequencing genomes in a high-throughput manner came up. And the first one of those techniques was called 454 pyrosequencing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you still remember. Sure, right? It's already been a couple of years, <laughs> and there have been many yeah. other methods in the meantime. Um, but that was my lifesaver, because now we could get genome information without having to clone pieces of the viral genome right. in, and clone it in bacteria. So we got, I think, around 50 contigs, so 50 pieces of the viral chromosome back from those 454 sequencing experiments. And then I spent the rest of my time basically piecing together those 50 pieces into one contiguous sequence. So it was like a genomic jigsaw puzzle. Mm. And I did that by uh, using random um, combinations of PCR primers that were facing outwards from the ends of each, each of those contexts. And whenever I got a product, I could sequence it and then mm -hmm. link two pieces together, mm -hmm. right? So that's how we ended up with the genome sequence. And how, what was the total length of the genome? The total length uh, was just under 700,000 base pairs. Um, Similar to Mimi virus? Uh, no, Mimi virus is quite a bit larger. 1.2? It's 1.2, okay. exactly, right. 1.2 megabases, right? All right. And so here we're dealing with a genome of about 700 kilobases, okay. which is still a fair size for a virus. Yeah, so you completed this in, uh, in Vancouver. Yes, exactly. Correct. But back to the problem why I couldn't again. amplify yes. it, right? <laughs> yes. Because that turned out to be a very interesting um, side project, which then turned into a major paper. And again, uh, the Mimi virus system was a tiny bit faster than we were, mm -hmm. because what they had found was that there was a second virus in their system with the amoeba and the Mimi virus, which was able to parasitize the Mimi virus in a co-infection event in the common right. amoeba cell. Right. And they had described this just a few months before we got our first genome sequences back. And when I looked at these contexts, I saw that there was something that looked very suspiciously like the virus they had described as a parasite of the Mimi virus, which in was your, called Sputnik. In your viral Crow-V sequence. Exactly. Hmm. So we found Sputnik, a, yeah. a little extra genome in our genome sequence data that corresponded to a so-called virophage. So it was oh, not part of the uh, Crow-V genome? No, it, it was, was separate. Extra. It was separate, So exactly. when you got that, uh, you had already known about the Sputnik? We had already known about okay. the Sputnik for a few months. The sequence had been published. So it was relatively easy then uh, to add one and, and one. And we knew that we had a, an interfering virus in our system as well. Because I'm just thinking in terms of, if you didn't know anything about Sputnik and you get Crow-V genome, which, and you get contigs that overlap, and then you have this separate contig, what it would, would have been thought? much harder to come to the same conclusion. You, did, would you have thought that was a separate virus or you maybe thought it was a piece of the genome that couldn't be fit in? Well, <laughs> being in Curtis's lab is a great experience also because you can bounce the craziest ideas around and you're not being mm -hmm. scolded for that. So Curtis always had the idea that maybe there's a phage that can infect the mitochondria inside the cell, right? So mm -hmm. the idea of a second virus infecting the first one wasn't completely off the table, although this was not something we had discussed as a viable hypothesis at the right. time. But I think we would have eventually figured it out given another year or yeah. two. So the, the Sputnik Mimi virus system is that the, the Sputnik interferes with the yield of Mimi virus. Correct? Exactly. So you were thinking that this is what's going on with your uh, Crow-V attempts to grow. Right? Exactly. 
And that turned out to be the case. And how did you so deal the, with it? At the same time, we also had electron microscopy data from mm -hmm. thin sections of infected cells where we didn't easily could also identify a small virus particle in the same compartment where Crowby was replicating, which is the cytoplasm of the host cell. And how did you solve the problem of getting to grow Crow-V without this, this other virus? By the way, what did you call the, uh, the other virus, the Sputnik-like? Well, um, it turned out to be similar to a type of uh, transposable element that had been called Mavericks or Polyntons at the time. So we called it uh, the Maverick-related virus, or short, Marvirus. So you mentioned the word polyntin. What does that mean? So polyntin, um, I think that's a topic we will maybe touch upon a bit later. Mm -hmm. um, but it basically is um, consistent of the polymerase and the integrase. So if you take okay. the pol from the polymerase and the int from the integrase, which are the two most conserved genes in those elements, mm -hmm. then you end up with the name polyntin. Yeah, so these are pieces of DNA that move around cells exactly. by virtue of the polymerase and the integrase. Exactly. And th th that those sequences were similar to Sputnik. Is that correct? Those were not similar to Sputnik. But to your virus. But to the Ma virus that Got we it. had. Yes. Okay. So there was a piece of the Ma virus genome that was similar to those Maverick polyntin elements okay. and another piece that was similar to the Sputnik and ones. And that's why you called it Maverick, basically. Exactly. Yes. All right. Ma virus is the name of it. So Ma virus, and now this is a reason why you can't grow stocks. So how did you deal with that? So we did indeed use the last of our old stocks <laughs> to produce sufficient amounts of Crow-V to do our experiments. Um, but eventually I figured out a way of getting rid of the uh, virophage of Ma virus mm -hmm. from those lysates. Um, but that didn't happen until I moved to Heidelberg. So. Okay. So let's, let's move to Heidelberg and then we'll go back to this whole idea of interfering viruses or satellite. Do they... Do they require something from the large virus? To, they do, right? That's why they, they re do. reproduce exactly. in, in factories in the cell in which the giant viruses reproduce. So okay. maybe we should uh, back up a little bit and talk about how these giant viruses replicate. All right. Let, before right. that, let's say, let's get you to Heidelberg. Okay. So sure. you, you finished a postdoc mm -hmm. in um, a PhD in, in Vancouver. I did. And then you want to come back home to Germany, I guess, right? Yes. And so I found a place here in Heidelberg mm -hmm. um, where I was welcome because I brought these unusual large viruses, right. which turned out to be also fascinating for other techniques. So here at the Institute, they're using them uh, to shoot them into a high power laser mm. um, to do test a novel method for reconstructing 3D structures of right. proteins. Right. So that was what year you came back to uh, Germany? That was, uh, I came back in 2010. And then okay. in 2011, I started here in Heidelberg. All right, so that's where you are. That's where you are now. We're sitting in your office, and you've been continuing research on these large virus, I should say, protists it, as hosts, right? Absolutely. And last night I asked you at dinner, "What is a protist?" So tell me <laughs> what it is. So protist is a, a very old term, actually. That I think originally it was meant to refer to bacteria. If you go all the way back, mm -hmm. nowadays it's strictly speaking eukaryotes that don't fit into either animals, plants, or fungi. Okay, and they're sing do they have to be single-celled? or? Most of them are single-celled. There are some exceptions of multicellular or colonial organisms. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the best examples is kelp, one of these algae that you find on the beach, yeah. which look like macroalgae, but um, technically speaking, they okay. are protists. So protists include algae, they include, uh, include algae, amoeba, yes. Most amoeba, of them are microscopic. Right. Then amoeba, ciliates, flagellates. So cafeteria is a is a flagellate. Cafeteria is a flagellate. So that's two flagella, exactly. Okay. And, and then, uh, and you find these in both salt and freshwater environments. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. All right. So now, now we can go back to giant virus. You're going to talk about how they they replicate, and that'll explain to us how these uh, satellites. So the virophages or yeah. virophages. So the French group called them a virophage because they interfere with the reproduction of the helper, right? Yes, exactly. So what's is there one name that would encompass all of them? Because I know they they have different properties. Um, we know very little about the diversity, especially about the phenotypic diversity of these virophages. So we only have a very few amount of cultured systems that we can study. So the Sputnik Mimivirus right. system is one of them. Mm -hmm. We established a second one with Marvirus Ma and Kirby. Right. And there are maybe two or three additional what? ones that came up in the meantime. What are they? What's the name of those? Uh, the latest one uh, is a Chlorella species, which acts as the host. 
And then we have a giant virus that is related to Crow-V, but um, still probably a different family if you get down to it. And that's from a pond in China, actually. What is the organic lake? Was it virophage? The organic lake virophage was uh, one of the first metagenomic sequences of virophages that have been published. Okay. And so that means we don't have it in culture. I don't right? have a host. We don't know what the host is. We don't know what the host is. We have a good idea about the genome of the giant virus that it associates with, because that came from the same sample and was okay. also sequenced by metagenomics. But we don't know anything about the biology of this system, unfortunately. Okay. So you wanted to talk a little bit about how giant viruses reproduce? Yeah, I think you touched upon this in quite a few episodes of TWIF in mm -hmm. the past. So these are, in the past, have been called nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses, mm -hmm. uh, which is a bit of a term, right? So it has nucleus and cytoplasmic in there. And I think originally they just wanted to call them cytoplasmic large DNA viruses because most of them replicate exclusively in the cytoplasm. But then I think during review of that paper, uh, one reviewer noted that there are also some of these large viruses that have a nuclear phase. Yeah. And so they made them change the name to nuclear what side. then became NCLDBs, a very commonly used abbreviation in our field. But which nowadays they have been reclassified into mm -hmm. a proper taxon, uh, which is the phylum Nucleocytoviricota. So they still retain the name, but it's now slightly differently pronounced. Nucleocytoviricota. That's right. You can <laughs> okay. Do like, it the Italian way. The Italian way of <laughs> pronouncing it. Right. Okay. And all of these have an extensive amount of genes that they bring with it into the host cell. And often what they bring is a complete machinery for transcribing their own genes. For making RNA from DNA. Absolutely right. right. Okay. And usually viruses would either have an RNA polymerase to do that if they have an RNA genome, or if it's a double stranded DNA virus, it might go into the nucleus and use the host cell machinery. But that's not the case here. So these viruses are so complex in their enzymatic machinery that they basically bring their own version of this transcription system. Mm -hmm. And they set this up in the cytoplasm in their own compartment, which you call the viral factory. Mm -hmm. And within the viral factory, you find all these RNA polymerase subunits, you find transcription factors, uh, you find capping enzymes, you name it. Everything is there to make RNA from the genes. And that is the most important property when you talk about the dependence of virophages on their giant virus helpers. Because the virophages, they also don't use the host machinery, mm -hmm. but their genomes are too small to bring their own transcription enzymes. So what they do is they have specialized, for whatever reason, to exclusively rely on the transcription machinery that's brought in by the giant virus, okay. which is present only in the cytoplasm. So that's where they have to be at the right time in the right cell mm -hmm. to get the genes transcribed. Okay, and by the way, these RNAs that are made in these factories, are they translated in the factory or do they go out into the cytosol to be translated into protein? So typically what we see in electromicrographs is that these um, factories have a very fine texture that excludes ribosomes. Okay. So the common notion is that the mRNA is transported to, to the periphery of this factory where the proteins are made and then they're shuttled back into the factory. Okay, and these proteins would include DNA replication proteins. For example, and, yes. And also structural proteins, because the virus particles are assembled within this factory, right? Absolutely right, yeah. All right, so the, the virophages or satellites, Myvirus and Sputnik, those are the two main ones we've talked about so far. These interfere with the production of the, uh, the helper virus. Right. right. And how do they do that? Well, that's a good question because it's not really known what the molecular basis for that interference is. The most common assumption, also based on our own experience with this system, is that it's a competition effect. That the virophage is just more efficient in recruiting those transcription factors. So I should also mention that um, the reason why it can utilize the giant virus machinery is that it carries the same sequences upstream of its genes mm -hmm. that the giant virus has when it switches into the late phase of its infection cycle. And there a special type of protein is made, a transcription factor that can recognize mm -hmm. this promoter sequence which sits upstream of the genes. And exactly that promoter sequence is used for all of the genes in the virophage genome. So already by bioinformatic prediction, 
Mm. We had a very good idea when the virophage would become active during the infection cycle of the giant right. virus. Okay. Right? So they basically recruit away all those essential transcription proteins, uh, leaving nothing behind for the giant virus to make its structural proteins, which would be the main purpose of the late phase. Okay. So is that what we need to know about the, the reproduction of these giant viruses and the satellites? Oh, I think there is much more to talk about. But uh, for once, we don't know even half of the enzymatic capabilities of yeah, these giant sure. viruses. Many of their genes have no known homologs. If they have homologs, then we still cannot be sure about their function. You talked about this uh, great eLife paper sometime in the past uh, by Chantal Abergel's lab right. um, about the genomic fiber in Mimivirus, mm -hmm. which is made of a protein that was originally thought to be an oxidoreductase, a redox right. protein. Right. But it actually performs uh, two different structural functions in the Mimivirus. So if you so you, you cannot be sure about yeah, this. Yeah, the point is if you see a, a protein and you say, oh, this is an oxidoreductase, it may not be. It may, it may not be. It may have acquired a completely different function during the time it resided in the viral genome. Because originally it was presumably a cellular gene, right? Most likely, Most yes. Most likely, exactly. Yeah. So the, um, we don't know the mechanism of interference, but the, the point is that these, um, these satellites interfere. So they're a way of protecting the host, really, right? That turns out to be a very interesting side effect. Mm -hmm. And I think it has quite a significant implication for the ecology of these organisms. Um, but I also have to say that we shouldn't generalize. There are virophages out there that live in perfect harmony with their helpers, they with their giant viruses. They don't interfere with them. They don't interfere. They replicate so, alongside with it. Yeah. One example is the, the Tsamilon virophage, yeah. uh, which I think is Algerian or Tunisian for a little companion. Mm -hmm. right? so <laughs> Sputnik is Russian for that. Um, we named our MAR virus strain uh, Spitzel, which is the Bavarian term for companion. So you see there's a, there's a theme to, to naming these nice. things. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But uh, that's an example of, of a virophage that doesn't interfere with the replication of the giant virus. Okay. And therefore, mm -hmm. it also has no effect on host cell survival. But what we found in MAR virus, which had already been described uh, with, with Sputnik and Mimi virus before, but even to a greater degree in, in MAR virus in the cafeteria system was this protection of the host population through the presence of the virophage. Mm -hmm. And it took us quite some years to figure out how that might come about. Um, so basically what we're dealing with here is not a typical defense system as you might find it in bacteria or also in uh, multicellular organisms where you basically save the organism at the onset of infection. You can cure the infection, or you can even prevent the virus from getting started. So how it works in, uh, in this system with cafeteria and its viruses is that the virophage does not save the cell that is already infected with a giant virus. What it, would, what it can do is, during the co-infection, it prevents the production of new giant virus particles. But that cell will still die. That cell will still die. Right. But it is basically sacrificed yeah. in order to save the, the rest. rest of the population which hasn't been infected by the giant virus yet. So it's the survival of the uninfected, right. which overall looks like the host population survives. So is this a random process that a, a, a virophage and a giant virus will get into the same cell at the same time? There's no attachment to get them both in the same cell, right? For Sputnik and Mimi virus, there's probably physical attachment oh. because Mimi virus has these external fibers on its capsid, which are very sticky. Okay. And Sputnik is often observed uh, to be trapped in those fibers. Ah. So they may enter as a composite. Okay, very um, good. The yeah. question how they then escape from the phagosome um, yeah. is a different question for the virophage. But in the terms of Mar virus and Cro-V, Mar virus can get on, on, get inside the cell on its own. So it attaches probably to a receptor of the host cell. Mm -hmm. It is endocytosed. So it doesn't need the giant virus to get inside the cell. Right. But it cannot replicate without the right. giant virus. So it probably enters many cells without replicating because there's no giant virus. In exactly. Right. But and, and the giant virus can get in on its own. And if there's no uh, s s satellite, then it just kills the cell and makes lots of viruses. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. But initially, we wondered how this would be a viable system. Yeah because we saw a very strong inhibitory effect of Mar virus on Crow-B. So basically every cell that gets co-infected with those two viruses will only produce the virophage and not a single particle of Crow-B. Yeah, that's why you had so much trouble in the lab growing stocks. Right? It was very effective in uh, reducing the amount of Crow-B that came out, absolutely. Yeah. 
So we wondered how this would be um, viable on, on evolutionary timescales, right? And we found a solution to that a few years later when we figured out that Marvirus has a second strategy up its sleeve. <laughs> because similar to some bacteriophages, it can integrate into the host genome. And there it can remain silent for many generations. It's passed on passively by the dividing host cells mm -hmm. until such a giant virus comes and infects the host cell. Apparently, this infection event is then sensed by the otherwise silent genome that sits in the host cell nucleus. Mm -hmm. And the virophage genome is reactivated, it makes particles, and then the spread of the virophage can yeah, be resumed. Yeah. We, we don't know how the giant virus infection stimulates the production of this, the satellite, right? Mm -hmm. Our best hypothesis at the moment is that it also has to do with the same transcription factors. Okay, the, right. late, the late transcription factors. Exactly. Okay. But it's an interesting difference here in that situation because the giant virus replicates in the cytoplasm. As far as we know, it has no business in the nucleus. Mm -hmm. But that's exactly where these transcription factors need to go in order to activate mm -hmm. the silent, mm -hmm. the, the dormant uh, virophage. So how does that happen? So yeah, it, right, right, because the, the virophage is in the nuclear DNA, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. So some of these giant virus transcription factors need to migrate inside they, the nucleus. Do they have nuclear localization? Well, well, maybe that's not a thing in, uh, in produce. They, they don't. Well, they, of course, no, that's a thing. It's a thing, yeah. yeah, yeah. that's okay. universally conserved. Um, but as far as we know, there's no NLS in NLS. those okay. um, <laughs> proteins. So we think that either the nuclear uh, membrane is compromised at some point during infection, so there might just be leakage, mm. and any protein can go in. Yeah or it is indeed transported at low levels. Why did you even look in the genome of the host for this virophage sequence? There must have been some reason, right? Or did you do it accidentally? Well, we got a clue by looking at the genome of Marvirus. So when we had mm -hmm. the full genome sequence, of course, you're trying to figure out what the genes do. Mm -hmm. And one of the very recognizable genes that Marvirus carried was a retrovirus type integrase which in itself was completely unusual because no DNA virus before had carried such a gene, which sure. is obviously, as the name implies, typical for retroviruses and mm -hmm. retro elements. Right? Right. So now for the first time, we had a DNA virus with a very strange combination of a typical DNA polymerase right. and this retroviral integrase. Um, so we got a clue that this retroviral integrase might help the virus genome to integrate into okay. another piece of DNA. Okay. Right. That makes sense. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but initially, we didn't know whether this was the natural situation. Mm. So what we did is we took a host strain that didn't have Marvirus in its genome before, and we exposed it to a lot of Marvirus, which can get on inside the cell on its own, mm -hmm. as we talked mm -hmm. about. And then a week later, we uh, purified the DNA from those treated cells and sequenced it. And as a control, we sequenced the original strain. Mm -hmm. And then we looked for differences. And we found about a dozen integration events in the treated samples. So they were all scattered all over the genome. There was no specific place where they integrated. But clearly, Marvirus was able to get into right, the host right. cell genome very efficiently. So the, the, that infection simply lets the Marvirus DNA get into the host cell. It doesn't replicate because there's no helper. Right? Exactly. And so even though there's no replication, that DNA can get into the nuclear DNA via the integrase. Yes. Which is, is it in the particle? It is packaged. Ah. Because otherwise it would be stuck, right? Because uh, if yeah, you need transcription be, yeah, sure. in order to make the integrase first and you need a giant virus, mm. then the cell will not survive even if you manage to integrate. All right. So that's very smart. So it brings the integrase as a protein. It's, it's ready to go. Um, we don't know about the timing yet, if it waits around in the cytoplasm for some time to wait for a giant virus and then it goes in, or whether it immediately goes into the nucleus. Right, so these are right. still details that we have to figure out. Right. But it does integrate remarkably efficiently. We had never expected that. So it's not a mandatory step. I have to stress that. It's not like a retrovirus that needs to right. integrate sure. as part of its replication sure. cycle. But it still, I think, is an essential survival strategy to uh, endure these long times where a population might not encounter a suitable giant right. virus. Now, if you, when you have a Ma virus and Cro V in the same cell, does Ma virus ever integrate into the Cro V genome? Not that we had seen so far, no. That's weird, right? It should. It, it could and it potentially should, but um, there is another example of a virophage that does, and that's Sputnik. So Sputnik has been shown to integrate into the Mimivirus genome. Okay. 
But I also have to mention that although Sputnik also carries an integrase, it's a completely different type. Mm. It belongs to this large family of tyrosine recombinases. Okay. Um, for example, the lambda integrase right. falls into that category. And uh, these are more site specific. Okay. So it's possible that if you carry this tyrosine recombinase type, you're more prone to integrate into a giant virus genome. Whereas if you have the retroviral version, you're more prone to integrate into, into the, the host genome. genome. Okay, so the Mavirus uh, Curl V system suggests that Mavirus is actually protecting the host cells because it's retained in the host cell genome. Yes. And then when Mavirus comes in with a, and there's a giant virus there, it will protect the population, right? So the question now is, is this a laboratory specific thing or is this happening in the real world? And can you get other examples? Of Absolutely. It? I mean, that was the big question all along, right? <laughs> right. Um, so with these laboratory experiments, it was basically a proof of principle. Right. Because Marvirus already was delivered to us in the particle form. Right. We didn't know about its endogenous mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. um, so now we could see that it integrates very efficiently into the host genome. And the next question was, as you said, is this happening in nature? Right. We thought it would be, but we didn't know. There were no genomes available for cafeteria at the mm -hmm. time. So what do you do? Well, you sequence your own genomes. So we took a couple of strains from our collection. Cafeteria. Cafeteria. Mm -hmm. uh, we purified the DNA and we sequenced it. Um, now with new techniques, so we had Illumina sequencing, mm -hmm. um, we had PacBio, Pacific Biosciences, which is the first technique that produces very long sequences, very long reads which makes it easier to assemble a complex genome. So that really helped us along the way. Still, it wasn't easy. Um, so these virophages are not easy to find if you don't know exactly what you're looking for. <laughs> so that feeds into the bioinformatics discussion yeah. and computational analysis of genomes, which is uh, a whole tricky business in itself. But we really had problems initially, so we, we knew that the virophage would be integrated into the host genome in those early experiments because we did PCR, right? And, right? and we could clearly associate that signal with integrations. But still in the early sequencing experiments that we did, which were just done with Illumina sequencing, we could not find any trace of the virophage. And that was very, mm -hmm. very peculiar. And only later we figured out that it has to do with the protocol that they used at the time for preparing the sequencing libraries for Illumina, which included a PCR amplification step. And that apparently had a strong bias against AT-rich DNA. Mm -hmm. right, so you have the four different nucleotides and the genomes can have either more Gs and Cs or more As and Ts or it's rather balanced. In this case, if you're dealing with the viruses, they have a very high percentage of AT about 70% of the nucleotides are A's and T's. The host genome of cafeteria is exactly the opposite. It has 70% of G's and C's. So with this sequencing method mm -hmm. and this PCR amplification step, apparently only the GC regions, rich regions were amplified, whereas all these virophage genomes okay. were poorly amplified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that explains why you can't uh, So that's why we didn't them find them in the at, first in place. In the cafeteria genome, right? In the cafeteria genome. So we had to modify the protocol. We sure. uh, just skipped the PCR and that worked fine. But it also told us that maybe it's not that easy to find it in other organisms for other people, especially if you're not looking for exactly those biophages. Right. I mean, the question then is, if you look in all the protist genomes that we have, do you find signatures of these? You could look for the um, the integrase, right? The, that's specific to my virus yes. and other genomes, or for the other, for the um, Sputnik, was a tyrosine recombinase. recombinase, right? Yes, yes, you can do that. And nowadays we know that they're all over the place, but that is only a very recent development. Mm -hmm. So there was a paper in 2015 um, that looked specifically for integrated virophages in all the published um, eukaryotic genomes that mm -hmm. were available at the time. Mm -hmm. And it actually only found one specific case mm -hmm. where they were clear that, yes, we had integrated virophages. Mm -hmm. And that was also in a protist in a marine alga called uh, Bigelobiella natans, <laughs> which is okay. a very strange uh, type of organism. It's, um, um, uh, yeah. The group is called chlorarachnophytes. And uh, they have gone secondary endosymbiosis, which is something you talked about uh, right. with Nels Eldi in a recent yeah. uh, Tvivo episode, right? right. Um, so they basically have to, to, to blast it along with its former host, which they still retain um, as a little pet, basically. It's mm -hmm. this nucleomorph, which is the remnant of the nucleus of the original host for the uh, plastid. 
Um, so these single-celled algae apparently also have integrated virophages. Okay. But for the rest of the published genomes, there was no trace of any mm -hmm. virophage integrations. So at the time, it really looked like this was an exceptional case. Mm. But again, <laughs> you have to look at the way that these genomes were produced. Mm -hmm. The method that has been used mostly for sequencing them was Illumina. And most people used the PCR amplification step. So if other virophages had a similarly high AT content, they would probably be neglected mm -hmm. in those sequencing experiments. Okay. The next problem comes if you're trying to assemble those sequences. Even if you get them sequenced in the first place, if they're present in the raw data, you have to piece the pieces together mm -hmm. to construct mm -hmm. your genomes. And that's not an easy process, right? So how do you do that? You look for overlap. And these virophage genomes, they don't just occur in one copy. There are multiple copy elements. Mm -hmm. And they occur in different positions of the genome. Right. They may also differ in their positions if your population is not clonal. So one cell might have them in a different position as yeah. another cell. Yeah. Right? Right. Then comes the fact that these are long elements. They're about 20 kilobases long. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. still, they are repetitive because they occur in multiple copies. They also have special repetitive ends, which makes it difficult. So if now such a computer algorithm encounters a virophage genome, it might be able to continue a little bit into it, but then it might find several possibilities at the end to continue because they're different integration mm. sites. And typically what an algorithm does in such a situation is it stops the assembly. So you get the end of the contig right there, even though it would continue in yeah, a natural yeah. situation. Um, often what you also get is separate contigs for these virophages, also because they differ in their AT content, sometimes from the host, mm -hmm. as we talked mm -hmm. about in cafeteria. So they're not together assembled with the host genome. And then the next step that you do is you weed out all the stuff that you don't want mm -hmm. in your final genome assembly, right? All the contamination that might be present in a sample. Right. And often you might have viral contamination. So you run an algorithm that identifies virus-like genes and throws out those contexts. <laughs> Something that looks obviously different yeah. than the yeah. rest of the genome. And of course, virophages would fall into that category. Yeah. So they often ended up in the waste bins if they had been sequenced and assembled at that point. So the genome sequences are not right because they're missing integrated virophages. Many of them certainly do. Nowadays, the situation has gotten better because many people use long read sequencing, especially nanopore technology mm -hmm. that really has changed the picture tremendously. And using mm -hmm. that long read sequencing and also looking in the waste bins of other people's projects, um, a postdoc in, um, in Innsbruck in Austria, mm -hmm. uh, Christopher Bellas, has uh, published a paper with us earlier this year where he looked specifically for these integrated elements, which include the virophages, but also many other elements which are remote relatives of virophages. Mm -hmm. And they're again related to these polyntons or maverick elements. Um, collectively, they're referred to as uh, polynton viruses. So this this is uh, Ma virus included, right? This includes Ma virus, this includes Sputnik, but it also includes other elements where we don't really know what they're doing. Okay. They look like they are viable yep. viruses, so they should be infectious. They mm -hmm. have all the structural proteins, but we have no idea what their lifestyle is. If yeah, they who, depend on another giant virus, right. if they're independent. And who, which virus and which host? Yeah, the host you can identify well, because you the have sequence, the, the, the sequence. genome sequence, exactly. right? We don't know the, the giant virus. Right. right. Mm. And what Chris very nicely showed is that basically every species of eukaryote has one or the other type of these integrating DNA viruses. So you say eukaryotes, do you mean protists or all eukaryotes? In this case, all eukaryotes. Because so even the, mammalian cells. So even mammalian cells have these polyntons. Hmm. So do they have structural proteins associated with them? They have structural proteins, yes. They uh -huh. have um, these double jelly roll matrix capsid proteins. So humans have, have these uh, ones? I'm not sure about humans. Uh, so I think humans may be a special case here. So we're, what are we talking about? What kind of organism? Oh, we're certainly talking about uh, lower vertebrates. Mm -hmm. You can find polyntons there. Um, you find them in all kinds of animals. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, nobody really has observed them in action. Right? Right. So they have been originally classified as uh, transposons. Right which would exclude them from the viral world, so to speak, even though, you know, it's sort of yeah. the, the same selfish mobile genetic element that we're talking so about. So tell, tell the listeners what a transposon is. So a transposon, in the simplest terms, is a jumping gene. piece of right? DNA. A piece that, of DNA that yeah. can move its position independently of the genome where it's integrated. 
And typically, they encode their own enzymes for that. But they don't package the genome in a particle like yeah. a virus would do. So the fact that there are uh, these virophage-like sequences in lower mammalian genomes, does that suggest that there's some giant virus that would infect those lower mammals as well? That's a difficult question to answer because these might be remnants um, mm. from the very past okay. where we may have encountered some of these giant viruses. Yeah. Um, they could be retained for different reasons. Often these endogenous viral sequences can uh, be co-opted for new functions mm -hmm. that serve the host. I mean, you have great okay. examples for that with the retroviral genes, right? Syncytion, for example. Um, mm -hmm. It's just one prominent example of many more that are right. sure to follow. Right, right. So we don't know if they're mm. still associated with uh, giant viruses, okay. but certainly for the proteists, many of them apparently are. Yeah. The fact that they're still in protease genomes suggests that they, they fulfill a function, right? They're intact. They have open reading frames, and they, or, or is that not always the case? Um, I think you have to be careful when you talk about they have a function, because that implies they have a function for the host, potentially. Right, right. And I think that very much depends on your point of view. Even in the strong phenotypic case of Marvirus, which protects the host, its host, yeah. um, it might just be the survival strategy of the virophage that it just fits into the selection scheme of evolution that is beneficial to save the host population in order to ensure your own persistence. Okay, so saving the host is a reasonable function to, yeah. to be selected for, right? Exactly. Right. But it's not the okay. host driving these interactions, I think. I may be wrong, but I think we should not fall into that trap of assuming that in the first place. But also, you said some of these uh, virophages don't protect the host. They just coexist, right? Exactly. So in that case, why would they be maintained in a host genome? That's why I think it's mainly driven by the viruses themselves hmm. as a mechanism for persistence. And as long as it's not so. detrimental I for the host so. cell. Yeah. So for example, in cafeteria, yeah. we were curious how many virophages can be packaged into a host genome. And it turns out it can comprise more than 10% of the entire DNA. <laughs> and it's still viable. It's amazing. Right? <laughs> well, I, I guess uh, bacteriophages become lysogens in, in their hosts, and that's an example. They persist, and it's not clear if it's any benefit to the host, but it's a viral strategy, as you say. Well, it's certainly right. beneficial in terms of horizontal gene transfer, right? right? And right. recombination. Yeah. So. Okay, so why don't the giant viruses sustain changes that make them not inhibited by the virophages? Well, with <laughs> any parasite host relationship, you will always find resistance. Right. And the same is true for giant viruses. And there is already one example that has been described, which is in mimivirus, where there's apparently um, some kind of system, they call it the, the mimivir system, um, which consists yeah. of a couple of genes mm -hmm. that might confer resistance specifically against some of these virophages, namely I think, Sputnik. Yeah, I think we covered that on TWIV, actually. You did. Yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. You, and you, you listen while you bike ride, right? I do, yes. <laughs> okay. It's quite entertaining. Do these uh, virophages recombine? They certainly recombine, especially if they're closely related and sitting in the same host genome. Um, so we're not quite sure yet what implications this mm. has for uh, the evolution of the host genomes themselves, but it might very well be that this is also a possibility uh, to refresh their gene content. Because for many of the proteists, we assume that they're asexual, so they're just dividing, but they don't mate, yeah. um, which is probably not true to begin with, because we know very little about their lifestyles. Many of them may have uh, something like cryptic sex that we don't know about. But it's also possible that these mobile genetic elements are a source for refreshing the genes that you have, for recombining it uh, mm. with other chromosomes and potentially other microorganisms that come in. And the giant viruses themselves can also pick up genes and move them around, right? Very much so, absolutely. I mean, look at the genomes, and uh, each giant virus genome mm. has basically a different set of unique genes that you don't find anywhere else. And the most logical assumption is that they have been picked up from a previous host. Right. So they're very efficient at taking up genes. Um, but they're also very good at losing them if they don't need them anymore. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me we have a couple of model systems for virophage giant virus interaction. We probably should have some more to be able to make some more generalizations, right? Is, are people working on this? People are working on it, but I have to say not enough. So a lot of the data that we have about giant viruses uh, comes from the Acantamoeba system with Mimivirus, mm. which has turned out to be a fantastic tool 
to look deep into what's happening with the host cells. Um, it also turned out to be a fantastic host to pull out different types of giant viruses. It's not just Mimi virus, of course. You talked about different ones in the past. There's these uh, Marseille viruses, which is mm -hmm. own family. Uh, there are Pandora viruses, there are Pifo viruses, Molly virus. Um, so do, do they have uh, virophages associated with them? Um, so far, the virophages are restricted to members of the order Imitaviralis. Um, which includes all the Mimi viruses and their relatives, including Crovi, including these algal okay. Mimi-like viruses. Okay. But for Pandora viruses, um, Pifo viruses, Marseille viruses, they haven't found any virophages so far. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, but back to your question. So yeah. this is the system that most people work on when they work on giant viruses. Um, so we tried to establish an alternative system over the years, and I think we contributed some data from mm. the cafeteria system, mm -hmm. but still, I mean, virophages and giant viruses don't just infect amoeba and these flagellates. They probably infect every clade of protist, every type of eukaryote that you can imagine. Do they infect humans? Uh, well, you have the pox viruses, right? But what about bigger viruses than pox, right? <laughs> I mean, there's many papers out there that suggest that humans get infected with Mimi viruses, right? Oh, what do you well, think about Well, many, those? there are some, right? Yeah, um, there's some. Well, according, if you talk to Eugene, I, I once asked Eugene at, a, at the giant virus meeting, I had lunch with them. Mm -hmm. I said, do they infect humans? He says, of course they do. <laughs> He's very emphatic. <laughs> well, yeah, um, but I'm not sure. I, I'm not convinced yet that they actually replicate in, uh, in our cells. What we, certainly the case is that we live together with giant viruses and we have them on us and in us because we might also be host for the hosts of these Mimi viruses. There's okay. a very nice okay. example, I think yeah. you mentioned it at some point, yeah. where there was uh, an amoeba isolated from a patient with keratitis. The amoeba was infected with the Mimi virus. The Mimi virus had its own virophage. Right. Right. So it's this microcosm yes. that yes. we carry yes. on us that we know nothing about. And apparently it doesn't <clears throat> affect us in, in either way. Wasn't there a prominent paper published saying that uh, Mimi virus infections were associated with people with mental illness? Uh, that was that, not Mimi virus. Well, a giant that, virus of some kind. Uh, that was one of these algal viruses. That was a chlorovirus. Chlorovirus, yeah. Yes, right. yes. Yeah, I think Jim Van Ent was on that paper. Exactly. Very controversial. Very right? controversial. <laughs> um, yeah, so I would be careful with my predictions okay. in that direction. Okay. Uh, but it's certainly possible that they have effects on us that we don't know about. Yeah. But as far as we know right now, we don't have to be afraid of giant viruses causing the next pandemic. Um, and I hope it stays that way, to be honest. But you... You're in, you and others are interested in finding more virus-host combinations that can be studied in terms exactly. of virophages, right? And it's not easy to do. I mean, you showed me yesterday in your lab the systems you use, and it's, it's hard, right? Yes, of course, but you can increase your chances um, if you know how to prepare the environmental samples. Mm -hmm. So that's part them. of it. You have to go somewhere and sample, You have to go right? somewhere, exactly. And then, then this map shows some of the lakes. Yeah, so we have a map of uh, the European Alps behind me. And uh, this is going to be our new playground. <laughs> so uh, I recently um, got the good news that one of my grants was approved, mm -hmm. which will allow us to look specifically at high mountain lakes in the Alps nice. and characterize their viral contents. And of course, we're also going to look at other microorganisms, including right. uh, bacteria and proteists. And that turns out to be a, a very exciting environment mm -hmm. because we've done some pilot studies in, in a lake um, in, the, in Austria also high altitude, and that turned out to be a very good environment to, first of all, um, collect your samples. It's not cluttered with stuff that you're not interested in. So there's very low biomass um, because these are oligotrophic lakes, which means they have low nutrient levels, mm -hmm. right? So whatever hosts you find there are probably well adapted to the extreme conditions mm -hmm. that you find in these lakes. So lots of UV irradiation in the summer, long freezing periods in the winter, so not everybody can tolerate oh, right, this, right? Right. So we find very discrete virus host systems there. And uh, already with just a few samples that we took, we found giant viruses that had morphologies like we hadn't seen them before. Mm -hmm. um, we had done a, a similar study where we just looked for shapes of virus particles in environmental samples. Mm -hmm. And that was a soil sample mm. where we teamed up with Jeff Blanchard from the University of Massachusetts. Right. And they had looked, or they had accidentally found giant virus genomes looking at these soil samples for metagenomics before. So we knew they should be present. Mm -hmm. 
So what we did is we shipped the sample over to Heidelberg and uh, purified the size fraction that contains these giant viruses. Mm -hmm. um, and then we took them under the electron microscope and we found an amazing array of shapes that obviously corresponded to giant virus particles, but they had tail structures like no other virus that has been described before. They had fibers, they had appendages, tentacle-like structures, mm -hmm. modified portals. So there's a whole lot of structural diversity mm -hmm. out there yeah. that we have absolutely no idea about. So is that what this image is here behind These are you? some of the drawings of the, uh, the different types of viruses that we found, exactly. These are from soil, and right? These are all from soil, and there's a preprint out there on BioArchive that you can look up. Okay. Um, where we talk about these in more detail. So this one with the fibers is Mimi virus like. This looks right? like a Mimi virus, but yeah. it has a, a second layer of yeah. presumably proteins that uh, cover the capsid, and then you have the external fiber layer. Exactly. And this one is interesting. It has long hairs at one end. Are those? They're all they're all fibers to like sort of like the Mimi virus. Right. So they're just asymmetric, yes. right? Yeah. So one of the surprises to be found in those right. samples is the diversity of fiber structures. We know fibers for Mimi virus mm -hmm. and a few others. But um, we always thought that this is restricted to a few types of virus. Now what right. we see is that basically every virus particle had some kind of um, fiber coverage in some sorts. And they can be long, they can be short, they can have uh, globular heads, they can have triangular heads, they can be curly fibers, straight fibers, so you name it. So there's an entire diversity of also glycosylation patterns on those fibers and underlying chemistry that is completely unexplored at this point. So one of your goals is to get a, vir a giant virus host system established in the laboratory that yes. might also have a, a viral phage that interferes and you can study that. Might be, it doesn't have to be the case. So in this case, with the uh, Alpine Lake projects, we will be interested in giant viruses that have these special unusual modifications on their campsites. And we okay. want to try to figure out, first of all, what do these things do? Are they important for infection? Um, are there some kind of environmental adaptation to the conditions you find in the lakes? For example, are they conferring resistance to UV? Are they helping the virus to stay afloat? Um, all of these questions mm -hmm. are possible. Mm -hmm. And then we try to figure out where these proteins came from that make up these special structures. How did the viruses acquire them? Mm -hmm. Did they steal them from the hosts? Did they get them from other viruses? Right. Are these right. Uh, modified mm -hmm. genes that they use for a different purpose in, uh, in the neighboring virus? So these are all questions that we're trying to explore. So uh, having talked for about an hour uh, on this topic, giant viruses and their hosts and, and viruses that interfere, why should a non-scientist be interested in learning about these things? I think if you just have a little bit of curiosity about the world that you <laughs> live in, um, this is certainly some interesting piece of trivia, right? These giant viruses were initially thought to be exceptional freaks of nature. Mm. You know, read some of the comments on the first uh, publications on Mimi virus. So it was thought that this was an exceptional finding. You got incredibly lucky to find those. Mm. But what we know now is luck doesn't have much to do with it. It's just that nobody cared to look before. And if we just open our eyes to what's right in front of us, yeah. I mean, look at the soil sample with all the viral diversity. That's basically on your doorstep, right? Mm. You're, you're treading on viruses of that kind all the time. And you have no idea what their function is, how they're influencing the ecology. Mm. Um, we know, of course, that viruses are important drivers of evolution. Sure. So with these experiments, we can study eukaryotes, um, which are not as complex as multicellular animals, for example. And we can do experiments in the lab, also experimental evolution experiments. Right. So we're trying to speed up the evolutionary process by putting them under certain conditions, bottleneck conditions. And then we can see how the viruses react, how the hosts react, how resistance plays out. So we can figure out how evolution works by looking at these examples directly from nature. So I think it will teach us a whole lot about the world that we live in. And who knows, many of these <laughs> exotic projects have turned out to be real useful in biotechnology. Just yeah. take the CRISPR-Cas system, right? Um, that was not a targeted search that led to an application. <laughs> of course. It, it was an observation <laughs> of some repetitive sequences yeah. in bacterial genomes, which led to this Indeed. whole revolution in, in medicine and biotech that we have nowadays. So I think if we just open our eyes and are aware of what's around us, uh, we can make tremendous progress um, 
in different fields. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So I'm a big proponent of fundamental research, as you can see. Yeah, I think you just need to be curious yes. and ask questions about what you see, and then good things happen. Absolutely. And mostly that's how good things happen, rather than by saying, we're going to discover a new gene editing protocol. No. No, those targeted <laughs> approaches uh, tend to fail a lot. So. I agree. I agree. But unfortunately, the funding sources think that they're important. And so, you know, in the US, we, we target diabetes and cancer and heart disease and so forth. But really, okay, that's fine. But you need to have some curiosity driven because that's what gives us CRISPR-Cas that may impact all of those diseases one day, right? Yeah, that's why I'm also so grateful to the European Union that um, <laughs> they approved this grant. That's so great. For anyone out there who loves hiking and electron microscopy, a weird combination, I know, but if there's anybody, <laughs> I will be looking for people to join my team in the future. Oh, I'm sure there are a lot of people that like being outside that uh, would love to participate. So this is, on the wall there, I don't think we'll be able to see it, but we have four photographs of the ring bar symposium on giant virus biology, which is in Tegernsee, Germany. Yes. I went to the first one and the fourth one, and now we're going to have the fifth one this week. That's Starting right. tomorrow, right? That's right. Why do, why do you do this? It's a lot of work. I've seen you go crazy here. Why do you organize this meeting? Oh, it's not as much work as you might think, but <laughs> <laughs> we're still a fairly small community. Mm. Um, so typically around 50 to 60 people who attend these meetings. But um, I started these in 2013 because it became apparent that the community had grown to a certain step where we needed our own meeting to exchange ideas. So previously we went to, uh, for example, this aquatic virus workshop, mm -hmm. right? But that was not exclusively about these giant viruses, of course. There are lots of bacteriophages, um, algal viruses, and a lot of diversity, which is great in itself. But the meeting became too big, basically, mm. um, to interact with just the core community. Um, so in 2013, I asked around if people would be interested in joining such a meeting, and so the response was an overwhelming yes. So we got together at this um, a nice venue in the south of Bavaria, um, mm -hmm. a castle owned by the Max Planck Society. Um, it, it's not big, but it was big enough, certainly for um, our mm -hmm. international small group. And these meetings kept going on. They were popular, so I held them every two years. Unfortunately, I had to cancel the one in 21 due to the pandemic, yeah. but now we're back at it and we're very happy to have them. Um, I try to bring in people that not only strictly work on giant viruses in the lab, but have different expertises that sort of feed into the biology of what giant viruses do. So that also includes, for example, structural biologists who work mm -hmm. on specific enzymes mm -hmm. uh, that could come from a giant virus, or it could be chemists who work on the glycosylation patterns on the surface of these giant virus capsids. It could also be bioinformaticians who have never seen a virus live in, <laughs> in front of them, right? Um, so different expertise is coming together, but all caring about these giant viruses and what they do. And I think that has already led to some new collaborations along the way. You just said uh, live virus. So are viruses alive, no, Matthias? The old question. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on your definition of life, right? Cool. Um, I was very interested in that question for many years. Um, mm -hmm. Then I thought it's, it's a bit too philosophical to be tackled by a scientist like me. Um, but what really changed my view on this question was uh, the introduction of the virus cell concept. Mm -hmm. um, I think there were uh, mostly Patrick Fortier who um, put this forward, but also people like Claudio uh, Bandea mm -hmm. was one of the prominent people to push this forward. And what the viral cell concept makes us see is that there's a distinction between a virus and a virus particle. Uh, because that's typically something that's very easily confused. A virus infected cell and a virus particle. Right. right. So the, yeah. the virus cell is the virus infected cell. Viral cell. That's the what virus they call cell. It. Okay. Exactly. And <laughs> that could very well be seen as the living phase of a virus. Sure. Because that's where all the enzymatic activity comes to play. Right? If you just look at the particle, there's not much going on. I'm not saying there's nothing going on, but very little. And generally, these are just vehicles to deliver the viral genome from one host cell to the next. Right? Mm. So they need to be little fortresses uh, against all these adverse environmental conditions. Mm. But what people typically then say is, well, this is the typical state of the virus, this particle form. But no, it's more like a spore. It's a persistent form yeah. that's just yeah. made as 
a helper to get you from one host to the next. So what the virus then really does and where it also evolves, some people say it's evolved by the host cell, right? But still, where it replicates its genome, where all the genes are transcribed, where the enzymatic activity plays out, is in the host cell. And it completely turns the metabolism of that infected host cell upside down. And that's been conserved, uh, confirmed on many different levels. So if you do transcriptomics, if you do metabolomics, an infected cell has a very different profile than an uninfected cell. Which basically means that for me, it's legitimate to say that viruses are alive during that intracellular phase right. when they are a virus cell. And that also fits nicely into this uh, analogy with the uh, virophages and the giant viruses because you could very well say that virophages are parasites of the virus cell. Virus cell, not the virus Not particle. the virus particles. Yes. So that's very important to stress. Yeah. So they don't interact outside the host cell yes. by penetrating the capsid of the giant virus and replicating there. That's not how it happens, right? It all happens yeah. Yeah. inside the infected cell. Now it's important because many people say to me, oh, did you know there's these viruses that reproduce inside other viruses? Yeah, if you see virus as the, the conceptual term, then yes. I might agree, but if you're referring to the particle, then that's clearly not the case. I think when most people say virus, they're referring to particle. By the way, let's grab those two particles here, just so we can, so this is a virus particle. Yeah, this is just this, a paper model, two. and this is another paper model, but this is about, um, so if you're listening and not seeing the video, sorry about that, but uh, this is about the size relationship between Crow-V, the giant virus, and uh, the virophage Mar virus. Yeah. So, I mean, you could, rep of course, imagine that it goes inside, it might fit inside, but it will also displace a lot of the important content that's already packaged in the giant virus particle. Mm. So I would imagine that if a giant virus carries such a virophage, it would no longer be infectious. It might still get inside right. the host cell, but right. it would not be able to fulfill its infection cycle. And yeah, there certainly wouldn't be any evolution to select for carrying the virophage inside the giant virus because it's detrimental to the giant virus. Right? Unless, of course, you have a higher multiplicity of infection, you get uh, infection by multiple mm -hmm. giant viruses. Some of them might carry the virophage, others won't, so they yeah. can- They can complement, uh, right? Complement it, exactly. Yeah. That might happen. Matthias, is there anything we didn't cover? I know there's a lot more in this, uh, this whole field of giant viruses and protists, but uh, is there anything that we should have covered that we didn't? So I think we're going to hear a lot more about these endogenous DNA viruses in eukaryotic genomes. Um, that mm -hmm. really just got started. Right. And there is so much diversity among these polyntone viruses um, that needs to be looked at in more detail. There's going to be a lot of reclassification. So mm -hmm. I avoided getting into tex taxonomy at this point because it's prone to change even within right. the next couple right. of months. Right. Right. But what we found out in the last years is that endogenous DNA viruses are very, very abundant among eukaryotes. Mm -hmm. And it's quite comparable to the situation in bacteria and archaea, where you have um, a lot of these um, inserting prophages. Right, right. right. Um, and also in vertebrates, where you have a lot of the endogenous retroviruses. So it seems there are different types of viruses which tend to endogenize in certain groups of hosts. And that just confirms to me how important viruses overall are for cellular evolution. Right. Uh, I have a paper here, large-scale invasion of unicellular eukaryotic genomes by integrating DNA viruses, this is April 2023. That's, That's the, the paper, paper I mentioned before by yeah. Christopher Bellas, yes. And you're on that paper as well. And this is um, PNAS. Uh, so this is the establishing study that says there are a lot of these integrated viruses. In I think this is the most uh, recent and most comprehensive one, but there have certainly been reports in that direction before. Yes. All right. That's great. We'll put a link to that. Before, before we leave, Matthias, uh, I usually don't do picks when I interview people, but I know you want to have one. So what is I would very on? much suggest a pick, yes. And uh, that is a webinar series that is going to be uh, hosted this winter by the International Society for Viruses of Microbes, or ISVM for short. So membership is free, you can sign up. And um, we are organizing this webinar series with talks by early career scientists working on exciting mm -hmm. projects that involve viruses infecting microorganisms. And it's called IWOM Free. So if you Google phage directory, IWOM, then you will find the page and you will find- IWOM. I V O M I V uh, I, I V O M uh, for viruses of microbes, 
And the first seminar is starting um, very soon, mid-December, and we're going to have more in uh, January, February, and March. So sign up for it. It's going to be nice content, very exciting research by early careers, and uh, we hope to see you there. So Viruses of Microbes next year is in Australia. Yes, the big meeting is in Australia and next year. The plan is for, for me to go and do some podcasts. That will be very exciting. So And you will go, so I'll see you there again. All right. Uh, that is uh, a special episode of TWIV at the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send your questions or comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. If you enjoy our work, please support us. We need to have your financial support to continue these programs. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. My guest today from the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research here in Heidelberg has been Matthias Fischer. Thank you so much, Matthias. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, I was looking forward to talking to you for many years, so happy to be able to do it. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music, and Jolene for the timestamps. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.